Thank you for your interest in A Man Called Peter. And uh, this is the virtual edition of the Geneva class, Stevens Valley Church. We are examining his life and his teachings. We've considered his life, and we've considered uh, First Peter, the first letter that he wrote. And I would uh, remind you that all of these uh, classes continue to be online on YouTube, on the Stevens Valley Church site. And today, we're going to be looking at the beginning of Second Peter, and this is just going to be an introduction. And today, I want us just to continue to consider the first two verses of Second Peter chapter 1. And there's some reasons for doing that, for spending a little time just introducing this, uh, this letter, because it is quite different from First Peter. So we'll look at the first two verses, and we'll be considering what can be known about this letter and what remains uncertain about this letter. Now, the commentator Linsky, the Lutheran commentator Linsky, uh, makes some points that are not necessarily uh, agreed upon by other commentators of, of the Bible. So we do encounter here, as we have seen before, where there are different viewpoints. And these are matters that really cannot be settled with uh, certainty one way or the other. But it's important to, to go as far as we can to try to understand, to get a much, as much of a background as we can. Now, five points that we want to look at First, before we get into the text, which, of course, is just the two verses. Number one, to consider that Peter is the author. He either is or is not the author, and there is evidence, uh, certainly, for the fact that he is the author, which is the conclusion that I have reached. <clears throat> Secondly, when was this letter written? Now, Peter does mention in the second letter, we'll look at that, that uh, it was the second time he had written. Question is, well, we would think it's going to be written after the first letter, which I think most scholars do agree. But again, Linsky, who is a deep, deep thinker and, and very critical in his analysis, uh, he has reached the conclusion, no, that this second letter uh, was actually written before the first letter. Now, if that's the case, it would be similar to the situation with Paul uh, when he says uh, that he had written uh, a first letter to the Corinthians that is obviously missing because in what we have is 1 Corinthians. Uh, Paul says, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you. So it's indeed possible, although the more lo logical interpretation would be that as we have it in the text in the Bible, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, in that order. And thirdly, to whom was it written? Again, Linsky suggests, and there is agreement among scholars, that it was probably written to a Gentile audience. Fourth, the subject of this letter. The subject of this letter is different, entirely different, from the first letter. We spent several weeks examining that, and you know that the theme of the first letter was that of impending suffering that's going to come upon these Christians who lived in Anatolia, five provinces of the Roman Empire in what is today Turkey. So what is the subject of this letter? The second letter is quite different. It is not a matter of uh, a coming <clears throat> persecution or suffering, it is a matter of coming apostasy. Now, there are many words to describe this. I've used the word apostasy. Uh, Linsky has another term, uh, something similar to libertine. Uh, and we'll see as we <clears throat> get into it exactly what Peter is saying about this falling away. Uh, it is doctrinal and it is moral. Uh, it is uh, uh, all-inclusive apostasy. And fifthly, the question of whether it really belongs <clears throat> in the canon of Scripture or not. 
because it is among a number of books that were accepted later than uh, most were. Uh, and some early fathers had a question about whether it should be included at all. But eventually, and by the fourth century, it was accepted. So you can see, when we try to examine these things that, that distinguish this particular letter, we do have some controversy, we do have some problems, and I don't propose that we're going to settle all of them in the next few minutes, but at least to set them out before you, and they're things to think about uh, in coming to an interpretation and understanding of Second Peter. Now let's take the first, we'll look at all these five points in a little more detail. <clears throat> first of all, the subject of authorship. Now, I'm going to take the position, I really believe the evidence does support it, that Peter, the same one who wrote 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter, the same one about whom we have studied throughout this uh, examination of Peter, his life and his teachings, I think that Peter was indeed the author of this second letter. Well, one reason, and I think a very important reason, is that the style is distinctly Peter's. All of the writers of the Bible, of the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, did have some distinctive stylistic uh, characteristics. And certainly that's true with Paul. Paul wrote most of the New Testament, so we're very familiar with Paul's style of writing. But when you look at Peter's, uh, he has his own. Now, that doesn't mean that he says anything that is contradictory to Paul or to any other writer of the Bible. New Testament or Old Testament. It simply is a matter that God used the personality, used the mind, used the circumstances, uh, the uh, character, the, the life experiences of these writers in composing the scriptures, but they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit. But they're not uh, just simply dictation from the Holy Spirit. Uh, they do involve the person <clears throat> who has been appointed to write. And so with Peter, we do have certain uh, characteristics and they are the characteristics in second peter are the same as first peter that leads us to the conclusion that first peter and second peter are from the same author and we have defined and do agree that first peter was written by peter that means second peter was written by peter now specifically there are some uh, characteristics that can be noted by scholars who really seriously look at the evidence. Uh, this kind of internal examination, uh, internal evidences, sometimes we, we call it, uh, it, is the mark of a careful scholar who looks at the Bible, not to uh, try to say that it's written by somebody else or it's not true. Uh, this kind of uh, approach to the scriptures uh, from the standpoint of one who is an unbeliever, we find that as we uh, encounter comments. But we're talking about people who accept the inspiration of the scriptures and are trying to understand the scriptures and understand uh, who wrote them and, and the circumstances involved in it because so that it will lead us to a, a more uh, comprehensive, true understanding of the text itself. So what are the similarities of First Peter and Second Peter? Number one, the repetition of words. Over and over and over again, Peter will use the same words. Now, just an example, we have been studying First Peter, and he will repeat the word sufferings over and over again, uh, because that's what he's emphasizing in this letter. Um, and while we're talking about repetition, often it's repetition of plural abstract nouns. Abstract nouns, that means nouns that refer to things that are not physical in and of themselves, but uh, ideas and philosophies and spiritual things, but in the plural of it. Now, uh, I find three examples right at the very beginning of First Peter, and that is the word blessings, the word glories, the word sufferings. Notice that these are nouns, but they're in the plural. Blessing, blessings, glory, glories. And that's an interesting thing, glories in the plural, and not suffering, but sufferings. Now, that is characteristic of Peter. 
And not only are these plural abstract nouns used, but they are repeated over and over and over again. I think about the time that, that Peter will repeat uh, the fact that we need to be sober minded. We need to be serious minded. And you can just go through First Peter and see this repetition. You can go through Second Peter and see repetition. Now, sometimes it's different uh, that points that are emphasized, but the fact that words are repeated and the words uh, of abstract nouns are to be found as well. Now, the next characteristic is that Peter always has a main point that he is getting across in the letter. <clears throat> the main point of First Peter is obviously to be prepared for sufferings. The main point of Second Peter is to be prepared for <clears throat> and to move away from false teaching, uh, heresy, and the kind of uh, teaching that would deny Christ even, therefore apostasies. But the main point in both letters is approached gradually, slowly introduced, and then developed. Now, there's another situation, another uh, reason for believing that Peter is the author, uh, and that is, if he's not the author, it would have to be some forger who is uh, claiming to be Peter and, and is not uh, telling the truth and is trying to uh, deceive, uh, trying to build upon the authority of an apostle uh, to give credibility to his letter. But one reason, now this, this I, you'll have to think deeply about because this is Linsky's thought, and it makes sense if you think uh, carefully about it. Peter does include personal information. Now we're talking about um, in, in Second Peter at this time. <clears throat> and he does include personal information. Now, either that is Peter writing about himself, or it is someone who is impersonating him, uh, writing a forgery about him. Now let's look at two examples where Peter mentions something about himself. In Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 14, he will say, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. In other words, I'm going to die before long. Christ has revealed that to me, and I know this is coming close. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, just two verses from the verse 14, he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, question, why do and how do these two references to himself uh, give, lend credibility to the fact that Peter himself wrote it rather than a forger? And here's what Linsky suggests, and I think in this case I would agree with Linsky. Uh, he says, if you were a forger, and if you are trying to deceive and you're trying to create a, an illusion of being someone you're not, then you would not stop with just a simple statement. In other words, you would go on and embellish it. You would go on and add more detail because you think that the more detail that you add to it and the more description that you give, uh, then the more convincing it will be to your audience. But there's no embellishment here. As you see from these two verses, just a simple statement, and that stops. So based on that, Linsky concludes, I agree with him, that this is not a forgery. This is Peter writing about himself, because this is not the way a forger would approach it. Second point, <clears throat> when was it written? Logical uh, conclusion about it is uh, First Peter was written before Second Peter. And why would Linsky think otherwise? Linsky's conclusion, as I mentioned earlier, is his reference to its being the second letter implies that there was an earlier letter which was lost, like Paul's lost letter to the Corinthians. And he's basing it on the fact that Second Peter, what we call Second Peter, was actually written before First Peter. Well, why would he reach that conclusion? Well, <clears throat> there is no mention of any kind of impending 
persecution or impending sufferings that would suggest that it was before the time of Nero's opposition to the church. No mention at all of that. Now, uh, that would suggest, because if, if indeed Peter was killed, put to death in Nero's persecution of the church, which was of 65, 66, 67, along in there, then if that is not mentioned at all, then our conclusion would be that he wrote it before the problem arose of Nero's persecution of the church. Uh, because prior to the fire of Rome in 64, there was no uh, problem for Christians. Now, the Jews were a legal religion, uh, a religio licit, which means re a legal religion. Uh, Christians were not, but there was no reason to persecute the Christians in, in the days prior to the fire of Rome in 64, and Nero putting the uh, blame upon the Christians. Now, uh, I'm sure someone might say, but Nero was vicious and cruel and mean and irrational, and so he would have been likely to have persecuted the church for being uh, different or so, whatever. But there's something we need to understand about Nero. He's a very strange person, of course, he, mentally uh, unstable, no doubt about that. But when Nero first came to the throne, he was determined to avoid capital punishment, to avoid any kind of persecution, any kind of treatment of people that was inhumane and uh, unjust. That sounds very strange because it's completely contradictory to the picture we have of Nero, uh, presented by the uh, Roman biographers such as Tacitus and Suetonius. But it it's indeed seems to be the case. Uh, he was very conscientious about treating people with kindness and respect. However, what unhinged Nero, what really caused the change and what we might say is a 180 degree turn from the kind of person he started out to be, the kind of ruler he started out to be, because he had seen in the previous rulers, in, in, in Claudius, for instance, and before that in Gaius and in Tiberius, he had seen signs of cruelty and inhumane treatment, and he wanted to avoid that. But there was a law on the books in Rome. The law was that if a slave in a household uh, was to strike out at uh, murder or even to uh, injure or rebel against the master, that that's a capital offense. And further, it was added, all slaves in that household had to die. Well, that would, of course, cause the slaves to encourage each other to avoid any uh, rebellion or any uh, type of uh, action against the master. So what happened? That there was a household <clears throat> in Rome <clears throat> that had 400 slaves, obviously a wealthy household and large household to have 400 servants, 400 slaves. And in that household, uh, one of the slaves murdered the master. Now, the law says all of 400 must be put to death. Who would be the one to oversee the execution of these 400 slaves? It was Nero. He was the emperor. He had to carry out the law. Even the emperor was accountable to the law. The law was stood above the rulers. That was a, a system with, with Rome in, in the Roman Republic. Law was supreme. Uh, there was a statement that Lex Regis, uh, law rules, law is the king. So Nero had to put to death 600 people. That did it for him. That completely unhinged him. It had such an effect on his uh, mind that uh, he just turned and now became vicious and cruel. Now, I, I went through that scenario simply to point out that I think this is something that Linsky is using in his, his thinking. Uh, Nero was not the kind of person 
to have caused any persecution. Hence, a letter written to Christians during that period prior to Nero's change of demeanor, any letter written at that time would have no reference to persecution. That would make sense then for this second Peter letter, this letter we know as second Peter, to have been written before the other one. Afterwards, of course, Paul uh, Peter would be put to death, uh, and the subject of persecution would have been foremost in the minds of the writer. So if that is the case, that is an argument for Second uh, Peter being a preceding First Peter. Sounds strange to say that. Now, also, there is serious criticism in the second letter and none in the first. When Peter wrote to these Christians in Anatolia, he has nothing to say uh, to them uh, that condemns them, that criticizes them. He is simply warning them and telling them to be ready, uh, both in the example and the lives that they live, the conduct and, to, and their trust in Christ, uh, in their being serious minded, as you know, be ready for this impending persecution. But in the second letter, there is serious criticism. Now, that seems rather strange. If Peter is writing to the same people in the second letter, after having written in the first and saying nothing critical, that he would find many things critical to say in this second letter. Now, that also causes us to question that it's written to the same people, but we'll look at that in a moment. Now, on the other hand, now, th this was Linsky's viewpoint, that Second uh, Peter was written uh, actually before First uh, Peter, but Barnes, on the other hand, Albert Barnes, believes, as do I think most scholars, that it was written after First Peter, in the order that we have it in the Bible, First Peter and then Second Peter. And Barnes says also it was written to the same people. Now, of course, when we take that position, we have to encounter the problems that Linsky brings up that we have looked at just a moment ago. Now, Barnes thinks that both letters were written approximately the same time, around 63 or 64 at the latest, 65. And this dating would meet the, mean that Peter wrote uh, prior, wrote both letters prior to Nero's persecution. Now, the next point is... To whom was it written? And Linsky is going to say it was written to a Gentile audience. And he gives several reasons for that, and I agree with him on it. Uh, first of all, he points out that Peter uses the term Simeon. We'll look at that in a moment when we come to the uh, verses we're going to examine today. He uses the term Simeon. Now, this is the only time in the Bible, only time in the New Testament, where Peter is going to refer to himself by the title Simeon, which is the Hebrew form of the name Simon. Now, when he does that, that would establish him definitely to his readers as Jewish. We assume they would know that anyway, but it seems he's emphasizing it. Why at this time does he use this term Simeon? He uses it no other time. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the first letter, he doesn't even use the word Simon. Uh, and that is a very different term from what Gentiles would use and understand. They, it would immediately establish him and identify him as Jewish. And then, then he continues to say, and we'll look at this verse in, in a moment, to those who have a faith like ours, a faith like ours. So there is a difference here. The ours, given the fact that Peter has very openly said, I'm a Jew, so to speak, Simeon, ours would refer to Jews. It would seem that what Peter is saying by that I, a faith like ours is that you, Gentiles, have a faith like us Jews have. In other words, 
there is no difference in the sight of God. God sees Jews and Gentiles alike. Now, when we look at that particular situation, we're reminded of the fact that it was Peter who presided at the Jerusalem Council uh, and took the position that indeed the Gentiles did not have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be accepted as Christians. This was the controversy that had come up, particularly in Antioch. Uh, it was the reason for the calling of the uh, so-called Jerusalem Council in, and uh, the decision being made, no, we do not impose upon them uh, these various laws of, of the Jews. Uh, merely uh, that uh, they accept Christ and that they abstain from things that are particularly odious to Jews. But they do not have to be circumcised. They do not, have to, do not have to keep the law of Moses. Peter was the one to do that, and he stood very firmly on that. Uh, there was an occasion, of course, when Peter forgot himself and uh, actually withdrew from Gentiles with whom he was eating at the time that certain from James came from Jerusalem, and he seemed to be ashamed of, of, the, of the Gentiles. But I think every time Peter makes a mistake like that, uh, it, he tends to let it stay with him, and he emphasizes things in his letters that show, in other words, don't do what I did. Uh, so he's trying to say to these people, understand, you Gentiles are accepted in Christ on an equal basis with us Jews. Now, also, we can learn that the audience possessed some of Paul's letters, and uh, because he makes mention of Paul, and Paul never wrote to a solely Jewish audience. He was very conscious of the fact that the Lord had appointed him as the apostle to the Gentiles. Therefore, it looks like that we can say it was written to a Gentile audience. Now, I don't know that I would go to the point with the point that, that Barnes suggests it was written to the same people, that is, these five uh, provinces in Asia Minor, in, in, uh, in Anatolia, uh, it could have been uh, because they were largely Gentiles, but uh, at least we can say it was written to a Gentile audience. Now, fourth, the uh, appen the impending apostasy, something that is written about throughout the New Testament by other writers. For instance, the Apostle Paul had much to say about the subject of a coming, falling away, or apostasy in Acts 20, for instance, and in 2 Thessalonians 2. I want, let's, let's look at that particular passage. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And this same warning of a coming apostasy appears in 1 Timothy 4 and in 2 Timothy 3. John also wrote of a coming apostasy. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Point being, there was a general and a growing awareness of this situation throughout the first century after the establishment of the church. Whereas there is no warning of apostasy and no criticism of the audience, as we've seen in the first letter. And finally... This letter was accepted later as canonical than the others, uh, many of the others. Now, there were a few others that were uh, accepted late into the canon, uh, but the majority of them were accepted by absolute consensus uh, early on. Now, Linsky suggests, uh, and this is possibly the case, that the subject of impending persecution would have a more immediate appeal to readers than apostasy. In other words, uh, we're going to suffer. That would get people's attention. It, it, it would catch their, their thinking very quickly. Uh, 
Uh, and, and a coming apostasy, well, that's a bad thing, but that doesn't immediately impact us. That may or may not be the case as to why it was later. It is true that several of the early church fathers had doubts about Second Peter, as well as other uh, books of the New Testament, such as uh, Jude and, and James. Uh, one was Eusebius, the church historian who wrote at the time of Constantine. Also Origen, the, probably the most famous church father in the East, and Jerome, certainly one of the most famous fathers in the West, who wrote the Vulgate uh, text of the Bible. Now, these early church fathers had their doubts about it. The early Syriac version of the New Testament did not include it, although the later versions did. But by the fourth century, the letter was universally received as genuine. And now you might ask the question, in, in considering whether a book should be included in the canon of Scripture or not, and therefore being designated as canonical, what tests were applied to it? Well, of course, one test that would be applied would be that it would be perceived as authoritative. Uh, it would be consistent with everything else that, from books that we know were written by inspired writers. And also that that book would contain something unique that would justify its being included in the, in the canon, something different that was not included in the other books of the New Testament. And so uh, that, those are the criteria that were applied to any book, to all books, when they're being considered uh, for uh, acceptance into the canon. And there was some reservation about uh, Second Peter uh, based on, on these criteria, but later uh, it was resolved that they should be accepted. Now, we've spent some time looking at these general characteristics of Second Peter and how they differ from the first letter. At this point, let's look at the first two verses as we begin the study of the text. And we're going to just consider these two verses today because uh, at verse 3 and to verse 11, uh, Peter is going to be discussing the seven virtues of the Christian faith, and that is a study in and of itself. So we'll save that for our next study. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, we've noticed before uh, that he calls himself Simeon here, and he calls himself a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, those terms do not appear in the first letter. Uh, now, the word for servant is sometimes translated servant, sometimes translated slave. It's the word doulos. Alinsky suggests that the context indicates here a slave of Jesus Christ. Simeon is the Hebrew form of the word Simon. And Jesus addressed Peter as Simon. Uh, and if you look up Simon in a biblical uh, commentary, uh, you'll see that it is often said that it means rock. Actually, it evolved to mean rock. The word itself, whether it be Simeon in the Hebrew or Simon in the Greek, the word means he who listens, he who listens. And as it was used over the years, it was interpreted to mean one who listens to the word of God. And that developed into one who listens to the word of God seriously, who takes the word of God uh, with uh, faith and fidelity, and thus it came to mean rock, uh, one who listens like a rock, very firm in his belief in, in the word. Now, of course, the word Cephas uh, also means rock, uh, is the um, Hebrew form, or simply the word rock. And Peter often re was referred to by Paul. Paul talk, called him Cephas, the rock. In any instance, whether it is whether it is Simeon or Simon or Cephas, uh, 
the idea behind it is rock, firmness. And so the term evolved to mean one listening to the word of God with fidelity like a rock. And Peter says, I am a slave of Christ, but I am a slave who takes that Christ seriously, firmly like a rock. To those who have obtained a faith uh, equal with ours, have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. The idea of obtaining uh, simply reflects the fact that faith is a gift. We do not conjure up our own faith. We don't manufacture it out of nothing. We don't decide uh, that we're going to believe and, and just make that decision to believe. Uh, obviously, we do um, look at it as a part of us and, and, and a part of our decision, but it, it doesn't come to us from within us. It's not intrinsic within us. It comes to us externally uh, through the influence of God himself. So we have obtained it. We didn't conjure it. We didn't uh, uh, intrinsically have it. We have received it. We have obtained it, a faith of equal standing with ours. Now, the point of equal standing we've looked at before, uh, we have obtained a faith, and I suggest we Jews have obtained a faith of equal standing with you, uh, and you've obtained a faith of equal standing with us, therefore we have equal standing before God. There is no difference. Therefore the ours, as Peter uses it here, would refer to Jewish Christians and you Gentile Christians. So Peter is simply emphasizing that they as Gentiles have the identical faith that the Jews possessed. Now, this task of affirming equal standing of the Gentiles and Jews uh, is, is the task that was assigned to Peter and that he assumed from the very beginning. And as I said before, he, he failed to carry out at least in one, one instance in his life. So they have obtained this faith from God and they have obtained it by means of the righteousness of Christ. Everything that we have as a gift of God's grace comes to us by means of the righteousness of Christ. When we put our faith in Christ, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. And that is the only method of justification, the imputed righteousness of Christ. What is Peter saying here? You have the same imputed righteousness of Christ, the same faith that we have. It's all the same. It comes through our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then, may grace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Uh, knowledge, in, he, in this particular instance, the Greek word is epinosis. And the word gnosis means knowledge, from the, the verb gnosko, to know. So gnosis is knowledge. You heard about the Gnostics. Those are the people who, in the early days of the church, said you have to have certain special knowledge that we have in order to be saved. Therefore, you must join our particular group. But there's something different between gnosis and epinosis. For when epi, or ep, is joined to gnosis, uh, the preposition actually means uh, on top of or above epi, but when it's joined to uh, a noun, in this case, it intensifies the meaning of the noun. Now, how do we translate that into English? Well, there is no way to do that. So the translator simply said, multiplied to you in the knowledge uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the meaning is complete knowledge full knowledge, permanent knowledge, experiential knowledge. Uh, it, it is knowledge that is perfect in every way. Linsky says, to contrast gnosis with epinosis, there may be a false gnosis, but never a false epinosis. Now, the only way to teach this and try to convey this great truth is to stop and say, in this particular instance, the word knowledge comes from epinosis, meaning complete, full, permanent knowledge. 
and, and we'll try to do that. But it is important also to note what Peter says here, this complete, permanent, full knowledge comes to you through in connection with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, his usage in, in these verses of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, suggests he is talking about Christ. He's talking about the divinity of Christ. He's God. He's talking about the fact that he is the Messiah. He's the Savior, Jesus, our Lord. Uh, not to say that, of course, he does not believe <laughs> that uh, that God the Father is behind all of this as the one who has ordained it and planned it. But uh, he is emphasizing here that it has come through Jesus Christ, always in connection with Christ. So two verses, and next week, several verses. We're going to look at the seven Christian virtues in our next study. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and make his face to shine upon you, and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.